Hello again and welcome to part 7 of my beginner's guide to colour genetics in Budgerigars. And in this uh, episode or in this video we're going to revisit the idea behind how genes can be linked to another gene through the chromosome that they uh, sit on. Um, you may remember that we looked at this back in part 5 when we considered the X chromosome when we looked at those varieties that are linked uh, through the, the sex chromosomes, so the X and the Y uh, chromosomes in budget regards. If you haven't uh, seen that video, I'll place a link across the top of the screen at the moment um, so that you can um, revisit that one if you wish to before you uh, look at uh, this video. Um, as always, um, if you do enjoy uh, these videos or any of the other videos that I produce uh, via Shed Talk, then please do uh, hit the like button and of course please subscribe to the channel um, all the subscriptions do help and don't forget if you want to comment please do comment on any of the videos so let's go over now to the main presentation and look at gene linkage in budgerigars so here we are at the presentation and as always we're going to do a very quick um, recap on where we are just to remind ourselves in terms of um, how genes in chromosomes uh, work together. So based on the first uh, six of these videos you should by now have a reasonable understanding of genes and chromosomes and remember that um, genes are contained on chromosomes and they're contained in in the same place on each of the chromosomes so um, the blue gene for example is contained in the same place uh, whether it's mutated or not so uh, that's how genes in chromosomes um, each bird contains two sets of chromosomes so a pair of chromosomes containing two complete sets of genes um, and that there are around about 25 um, chromosomes within our budgerigar. So, so each bird will contain um, a pair of chromosomes um, which it inherits one from the parent, uh, oh, sorry, one from the cockbird and one from the henbird. So um, that's how it gets those two chromosomes and all of the genes are contained within those chromosomes. The important thing to remember here is that genes, the genes on a chromosome can only be passed on as a complete set. So if you imagine you've got a, you know, a string uh, with a whole load of beads running down it um, and you've got 25 of those um, uh, strings, those bead strings, um, you can't take a bead off and just pass that on. It has to go as a complete set, So, which means that um, all of the other um, genes on that chromosome are referred to as being linked via the chromosome. And we looked at this um, when we thought about the um, X chromosome and we knew that there, were, there are a number of varieties that sit on the X chromosome uh, such as opaline and uh, the uh, cinnamon uh, amongst others that sit, all sit on the X chromosome. So the genes for within the X chromosome must all be passed on as a complete set. Um, if you need to have a quick revision of that then do go back and have a, a look at part 5 where we covered the sex linked um, genes but um, as we go through this we'll do that explanation again or we'll talk about it a little bit as well anyway. So, so there we go that's a quick recap on where we are. I've put this next slide up and it says the importance of single and double factor in gene uh, linkage and this is because if we um, you know that a single factor means it contains one of a type of um, gene so let's con let's consider the um, spangle if it's a single factor it would only contain a single mutated um, spangle gene and the other spangle gene would be um, of the wild type and a double factor would um, be two of this, the um, spang uh, mutated spangle gene and none of the wild type. This becomes really interesting when we consider that genes are linked because you may have a wild type 
of say uh, and we're going to look at this so we'll talk about it so a wild type um, blue gene that would produce a green bird but a mutated dark factor gene and those two will, will both sit on the same chromosome so they will need to be passed on together which means that the wild type green gene and the dark green would be passed to as a single set so it, they can't be, be um, separated so and that really is what we're going to look at so I've mentioned here you know, the blue gene and dark gene are both located on the same chromosome so must be passed on together and what we'll do now is we'll consider the implications of that by looking at a number of pairings and we'll, we'll, as always we will use the uh, Punnett square to have a look at this so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a normal dark green okay so a single factor dark green remember dark factor is dominant um, and it, it and it is a sorry dark factor is co-dominant so there's an intermediate one so a single dark factor in a green bird produces dark green and a double fa dark factor would produce the olive um, so we're going to consider a, a, a dark green bird that's not split for blue and we're going to consider a cobalt which is again in the blue series we if it contains a dark factor it's a no if it contains no dark factor it's sky two, one dark factor is cobalt and two dark factors it's mauve so that's what we're con going to consider here now if you have a look at the way I've done this in terms of the uh, genes that we're looking at you'll notice that rather than splitting them into uh, the uh, blue gene and the dark gene I've linked the two together so if we look at the dark green you'll see that there's a B and then a dash and a D that is used to represent that they are linked on a single chromosome so we must only move those two when we're considering it in the Punnett square they will sit together all the time and likewise with any of the others so the uh, blue down below here so the blue um, one and the um, mutated dark factor there um, will also uh, both be passed on together and that as I say that must be reflected in the Punnett square so what we'll do now is we'll pop over we'll, we'll set the Punnett square up and we'll start to see what this means in terms of um, predicting the outcome uh, for that pairing so a dark green that's not split for blue and a cobalt so here is the first of the Punnett squares that we're going to look at uh, when we're thinking about this how gene predicting gene linkage um, will work um, across the top we've got the um, dark green and on the side we've got the cobalt and you can see that here um, we've, we're only considering so whilst we're considering two um, different genes um, in this case because they're they're linked we only need one square to represent each of the possible um, options for that bird passing it on to its offspring so for the dark green the first option is it will pass on the non um, or rather the wild type uh, blue gene and the mutated uh, dominant uh, dark gene or it will pass on the non mutated um, blue gene so green bird and the non mutated dark gene and for the cobalt um, it will pass on similarly you can see it here it will pass on the mutated um, blue gene and the mutated dark gene or else it can pass it can um, pass on the mutated blue gene and the non-mutated um, dark gene and we can see the various outcomes here so um, I'll talk through these and the first one we're going to look at is this one here um, which is the uh, top left of the um, possible outcomes um, and we can see that that one there has got a so it's got the non-mutated uh, wild type blue gene and a mutated um, blue gene so it's going to be a green split for um, blue um, but it also contains two of the dominant um, dark genes so in this case it's going to be an olive split for blue because it's a double factor dark which produces an olive bird 
Um, we'll now look down at the bottom um, right one, uh, the one in, that's light green, and, and this one, fairly simple, I don't really need to, shouldn't really need to explain it too much to you, but in this case we've got no of the, none of the mutated um, dark factors, so it's going to be um, a, I suppose a normal we would refer it to, um, and it contains one non-mutated green and one mutated, or oh, sorry, one non-mutated blue and one mutated blue, so it's going to be a green split for blue. So it's going to be a light green split for blue. Um, and the other two, uh, so the top right and the um, bottom left, um, they both contain a mutated, sorry, they both contain one of the non-mutated um, uh, green or blue genes and one of the mutated uh, dark um, genes. So they're going to be green split for blue because they also contain one of the mutated um, blue genes. Um, so they're both going to be green split for blue and because they both contain only one of the dark factors uh, it, it means that they're going to be a dark green split for blue. The interesting thing here, however, is that whilst their phenotype is exactly the same, actually their genotype is slightly different. And that's what we'll now consider. So, and I'll explain that um, now. So like I say, let's now consider the phenotype um, and, the, and the genotype for those two birds. We know that we're only containing a single phenotype, so it, see, so the way it looks, it will look like a dark green. But actually, we know that there were two possible outcomes in terms of the genotypes. Okay, and the first type of um, outcome is where we can see down here, where I've put type one, and you can see here that the dark mutated dark gene is actually linked to the non-mutated blue gene. So it's linked to an effect the green. And, and on a type 2, we can see that the dark, um, mutated dark gene is actually linked to, is actually linked to the um, mutated blue gene. So in one case, it's the dark factor is linked to the non-mutated, so in a type 1, it's linked to the non-mutated uh, blue gene, so it's the, in effect the wild type green, green and in the type 2 the dark factor is linked to the mutated blue gene. Now this has, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, this has implications when we now consider a future pairing. So here we are back at the um, Punnett square. Um, you can see the original um, crossing we looked at at the top and below it we're, we're looking at crossing a, a type 1 dark green um, split for blue, um, when all type 1 dark greens would be split for blue, and a, um, a sky blue, and we'll see what the potential outcomes are. So let's have a look at what we're going to get here. Um, so the first one, or the left hand side, we can see that it's going to be a, a, a dark green, and it will be a type 1 dark green. Um, the right hand side, we are going to get um, none of the dark factor have been of, um, or the mutated dark factor um, in this bird, so it will just be a sky blue. So in this pairing, so if we cross a dark green type 1 with a sky blue, we will only ever get, based on uh, the uh, Mendelian prediction, we will only ever get um, dark green type 1s, and uh, sky blues. You won't get any cobalts. Now, if you were to just, if you didn't have the gene linkage, we would expect her to be cobalts from that pairing because we're because of, you know a dark factor. We'd expect um, rather than 50% uh, dark green and 50% sky blue, you'd expect it to be 50%. Um, uh, sorry, 25% dark green, 25%. Uh, light green, 25% sky blue and 25% cobalt. If you don't believe me, just split them and have a go at predicting that using the Punnett square. So that's the outcome from um, when we're looking at predicting the dark green
type 1 with a sky blue and um, what I'd like you to do now is to just set up your own Punnett square to look at the um, a dark green type 2 also crossed with a, a sky blue um, if you pause the video now and try and do that and then we'll be back in a second when, um, and we'll have a look at what I've, my outcome is um, and see if it matches yours I expect you will already be gathering what that's likely to produce based on the type 1 what we're likely to produce based on a type 2 So I hope you had a chance to um, do the Punnett square. If you haven't, then just follow along with what, what I'm saying here. So here we've got our dark green uh, type 2 um, and our sky blue. And we get the exact opposite. So based on the Mendelian prediction, we're going to get the exact opposite where we've got 50% uh, of them being cobalt and 50% uh, of them being light green. Now that's an interesting um, uh, outcome based on the Mendelian um, prediction and based on the Punnett square that we've just done um, that we can get based so with the because there's gene linkage we'll get two completely different um, outcomes even though we're pairing two pheno type birds together so we've, we're putting together or crossing a dark green with a sky blue in both cases but we're expecting to get different outcomes whether it's a type 1 dark, um, dark green split for blue or a type 2 dark green so let's now consider that a little bit further so that's what the um, Mendelian prediction is telling us from a type 1 you only get dark greens and no cobalts and from a type 2 you only get cobalts and no dark greens however that's not the that doesn't reflect the reality of when we're breeding these two types of birds. I know, and anybody else that's breeding um, uh, dark factor birds will know that from a type 1 um, dark green you can get some cobalts. And likewise, from a type 2 you can get some dark greens. Um, and if this sounds a little bit familiar, there's a bit of a conundrum there because it's not following, it doesn't appear to be following Mendelian rules. Um, it's very similar, if you remember back to uh, the fifth video, when we spoke about the opaline cinnamon conundrum. When we, no matter how we paired up, we couldn't get the opaline, mutated opaline uh, gene and the mutated cinnamon gene onto the same bird. And yet we know that when we cross opaline and cinnamon together, we're likely to get a number of opaline cinnamons. So, in the same way as that um, opaline cinnamon conundrum is working, is the same way that the uh, dark factor is working to allow us to, pr to produce birds that we wouldn't expect to based purely on um, looking at Mendelian uh, predictions or Mendelian predictions um, and the Punnett square. So something else is happening and as I promised you when we were in when we looked at, at this in part five that's what we're going to cover now. We'll look at exactly how those two conundrums can be overcome and not actually, it's not magic. You know, it is a, and it, there are uh, logic behind it, some uh, science and nature behind it. And actually we could pretty much, to some extent, work out roughly how many we were likely to get. So that's what we're going to look at right now. So let's consider how this happens then. It happens for a process known as um, crossover and it happens when the cell um, that, is, that, that splits to produce either the sperm or the um, egg and the process that that happens produces a thing or as that happens can produce a thing uh, known as um, crossover. And here's the page that reflects how that happens taken from my beginner's guide to colour genetics in budgerigars. Um, if you haven't um, uh, downloaded that or seen that, go across to the Shed Talk Facebook page. Uh, you can find it on there. It's free to download. Um, if you're not a member of the Shed Talk um, Facebook page, then just uh, 
you know, ask to become a member and once you're a member you can um, of course you can uh, download this particular document. It contains a lot more information than the series, or these video series does. So you can see that, so if we look first at um, what is referred to here as um, picture 10 um, and that shows the, uh, you know, a very basic drawing of what the cell and chromosomes might look like. Remember we did this back in, I think it was in part one. Uh, so each cell contains two pairs of each of each chromosome. Uh, they're represented by all these wiggly lines. Um, and when they're just formed in that cell, um, they're actually just a whole bunch of chromosomes um, and there's no particular order um, to them. However, as the cell reproduction uh, begins, they begin to um, order themselves with each of the two pairs of chromosomes um, finding each other. So they begin to move together and we can see this if we look at the what I've put down as picture 11. So the chromosomes begin to migrate or begin to find each other um, and we can see that in picture 11. Um, and I, in picture 11 I've identified to the two genes that we refer to here. So you can see that I've got here um, the one that's marked in green is the uh, wild type and a uh, non-mutated uh, dark, uh, non -mutated dark um, gene and on the left we've got the mutated blue and a dark so in effect this is the bird that this is coming from is a type 2 dark green bird because the dark factor is linked to the blue the mutated blue gene so they find each other um, and they what, what then happens is that um, they produce two identical pairs of the set of that chromosome so that they find each other and produce two identical pairs of that chromosome and we can see this in um, the picture here the picture that's um, picture 12 of this um, During this process where the two have joined together, the two um, cells have joined together, something very interesting can happen. Um, and that's the process that we refer to as crossover. So the genes, all of the chromosomes, begin to get mixed up um, and they get entangled um, as, a, as a pair. So the pairs of chromosomes get entangled. Um, and at that point, they can split so they basically break and then rejoin because obviously you don't want the chromosomes completely broke but they can break and rejoin but they don't necessarily always rejoin with the chromosome that they broke so you can see in this case they when they break they actually join with the segment of the chromosome um, or the other chromosome they will always break in the same place so they're always the same number of genes on the chromosome and that can move the dark factor so the single dark factor from the um, blue the mutated blue on to the non-mutated um, green so in this case you can see here if we look at um, picture 14 we end up with four different possibilities so we the, the, the bird can now pass on rather than the original two possibilities so you can it could become it could be just a normal light green it could be a um, a dark green um, just a normal dark green or it could now could pass on the um, normal sky blue or it could be a um, the cobalt in effect um, gene so that's that's the four that can pass on you can see it there what I mean by that so in terms of the genes that um, it happens and this is known as um, crossover so let's think now about why you know that it only happens so often and why if this can happen some varieties are still more difficult to produce than others. So how 
we've explained how the um, crossover works. The interesting bit now is about what the chances are of that actually happening and why there is a more of a chance of it happening in say the opaline cinnamon than in say the um, Ino cinnamon that produces the uh, lace wing and this is known as the recombinant factor or the RF factor I'll refer to it as the RF factor from now on so why do some varieties have a different RF factor to others and what I'll do is I'll go back to the relevant page in the my PDF um, guide and we can see why we look at the um, the explanation in there as to why um, some varieties are likely to be are more common or some mixed varieties are more common than others based on gene linkage. So here's the page in the PDF document that I'm talking about and I would recommend that you read through this because it will explain it in a bit more detail than I'm going to in um, the, uh, this video but we can see here that we've got our um, uh, chromosomes and we've talked about um, where some of the various genes um, might sit um, and it, so we've got on here we've identified four different genes doesn't matter what they are but four possible different genes we've got A, B, C and D and you'll notice that they're contained both the two chromosomes in exactly the same place on the two chromosomes this we know this is called the loci and that they are the same in each of the two genes. So we said also that, sorry, each of the two chromosomes, we said also that the, when the chromosomes break and rejoin, they break in the same place. Now, it stands to reason that if we, can, if we consider gene A and gene B, okay, there's only one possible place where the chromosome can break, because there's only one other gene in between that. There's only one possible place that it can break and rejoin, to produce, to produce a crossover there for them both then to be moved across from one to the other. Whereas the ones that are a long, far apart, a long way apart, let's take consider A, gene A and gene D, anywhere in between those, those two genes, if the chromosome broke and rejoined back together, anywhere on there, it would produce the crossover. I hope that makes sense. So depending on how far apart on the chromosome the loci of the two genes in question are, will depend on the, how common um, it's likely to be that they will produce crossover and that's the RF um, uh, number that we will produce. So the further apart they are, the more likelihood that you will get crossover. The closer they are together, the less likely there is to be, cross, uh, to be crossover. So that's how it works and in fact we can get or we, we can use beyond me but scientists can produce can if they understand the size of the chromosome they understand the RF value for crossover they can work out where on the um, the chromosome each of the two genes sit and how far apart they are so that's how they um, work that out now also on this page I have very quickly um, put up on there you can see the uh, the RF um, percentage or the RF um, frequency that uh, a number of common variety has and, our, and we'll talk so we can see there why some varieties are more common than others. And I've rep reproduced that um, table um, in this slide of the presentation. Um, so there's some of the common varieties. So we can see that um, there's a one in three chance, 33% chance that you will get crossover between cinnamon and opaline, which is why the cinnamon opaline is uh, such a common variety, because actually there's a 1 in 3 chance, 33% chance, that if you cross a cinnamon with an opaline, you will get opaline cinnamon. However, if we consider the dark factor, it's much less. You know, there's only a 14% chance that the um, dark factor and the, or the dark factor mutated gene and the on one chromosome and the non-mutated dark factor on the other will actually cross over um, and produce a, um, a different type of bird, move from a type 1 to a type uh, 2. 
um, dark green. So there, there you can see it's only 14%. And if you look at the cinnamon and I know possibilities, only 3%. And that's why, you know, if you breed, if you were to cross um, I know with cinnamon um, continuously, there's only a 3% chance, you know, three times out of 100, only three out of 100 birds um, would ever produce be uh, cinnamon I know. And that's why the lacewing, which is just cinnamon and I know on the same um, bird, is so difficult or is a less common variety than the opaline cinnamon. So how far apart they are on the chromosome will impact or the two particular ones, two particular um, genes are, will impact on the likelihood of them crossing over. Of course it isn't just the colour varieties that are doing this, all of the, the chromosomes split and rejoin um, and actually it's, it's highly likely that this is a way of um, nature making sure that two siblings are never the same, are never identical because there are so many of those genes will have will have crossover will have happened. You know the the one that produces tallness or shortness, that that those genes may cross over. So you might get um, you, you'll never get two uh, offspring that look um, exactly the same. And indeed, that's probably why uh, none of our you know we might put, put two birds together that we assume are going to produce you know this the best best in show, um, and actually it produces something much less than say the the two parents um, and that's because of of crossover and we've ended up with all the bad bad um, genes on on a single bird um, and again you know that's why we line breed or we you know try to breed um, the birds birds together so that we are eliminating those bad genes and the chance of crossover and getting more bad genes on or we shouldn't call them bad genes, but the gene unwanted genes, the ones we don't favour in terms of exhibition budget regards, we minimise the number there are. So even if there is crossover, um, we don't get them all on the same bird. So that's the um, the way RF and the way crossover works. Like I say, if you need a lot more in-depth explanation or you want to re review that what I've just said, just go across to the um, the. Facebook page, Shed Talk Facebook page, and download the um, PDF document. So in the PDF document I I talk about a little bit around why uh, how you could then use that in terms of the Punnett square. So you could actually, if you're very good at maths, you could work out what the percentage likelihood um, is going to be of those varieties that are not predicted uh, by the Punnett square. It's more common, however, and if you look in um, books that are just dedicated to say, if you put, if you put this bird with this bird, you're going to get you know 25% this, 25% this, um, and and so on. That underneath it will merely say something like there are exceptions. So exceptions will be, and it will then say this. So for example, opaline cinnamon. If you move those two together, it will tell you, um, it will give you the outcome that you would expect from the Punnett square and then it will say exceptions will be opaline cinnamon birds. So an opaline cinnamon bird rather than just opalines and cinnamons. Um, so if you're doing the prediction and you know there's likely to be crossover um, you can say they're like you can predict and say exceptions will be opaline cinnamon you know um, dark factor type 2 or you might say that there's likely to be the exception might be that you get lacewing so those are the possibilities um, I put it at the top of this slide and finally it's not final. Okay so if you've got, let's take the opaline cinnamon and if you cross that with say an, an, an opaline um, there is a possibility that the um, the opaline and cinnamon that's on the same chromosome will split and then rejoin with the non-opaline uh, cinnamon uh, chromosome so so it's possible that it is possible that it works both ways crossover isn't final so you can it can separate it back out again into its uh, standard process and that is the chances of that happening are exactly the same as the chances of um, producing the two to get onto the same chromosome so crossover isn't final 
that's why that finally it's not the final bit is on that slide. So I hope you have some grasp now of why um, crossover happens. We've now explained the conundrum around the uh, opaline cinnamon. We've explained type 1 and type 2 in this um, in terms of the uh, dark greens, why we can have a type 1 and a type 2, and why okay, sometimes, even though genes are linked, and that when they're linked, they must be passed on as a complete set in a chromosome, due to crossover, sometimes there's a, a chance that they might split and rejoin, and it doesn't predict the outcome that we're expecting from the Punnett square. As I say, go back over, get the book out, and my PDF document out, and read through it. It gives it in a lot more detail. Chance to go through it in slow time, you might want to do it, get that out and read through it as you're going through this um, uh, video. So in the next video, part eight, um, which is the final video in this um, series, we're going to revisit the blue gene. Um, on this slide I've called it the um, par blues, um, and you'll find out why I've called it that in the next video. Um, and we're, but we're going to look at, along with the blue gene, um, we'll look at the uh, yellow face mutation 1, yellow face um, mutant 2, and the golden face. And we'll try to tease out and understand um, how those various varieties or those various um, mutations interact with each other as a gene um, family. Um, when I'm doing, when I'm going through that in, uh, in part 8, We'll look at a number of sources that I've used because um, I will be honest there is still some um, discussion amongst fanciers about how the um, yellow face genes um, interact with the blue gene. So what I will do is I'll talk about the sources where I've got it from um, and my understanding of how these interact um, and then leave it to you to make a decision for yourself and do some further reading. So, But all that is to come in part 8. Um, as always, if you enjoy these videos, don't forget to hit the like button and please do subscribe to the channel. But until part 8, um, I'll say goodbye.